Good morning. <laughs> Let's move this closer. Oh man, okay. Well, I, I exercise in the morning sometimes and oh, I thought, oh, I'd, I'll just hurry and get my workout done before the live stream. So I'm like cutting my brakes down and my last set of my last, I did four push-ups and it just about killed me. <laughs> and I just ran out here. Okay, I think we're reading the Bible today. <laughs> um, yeah, verse 16 of John 16. Um, why don't you do me a favor and get the word of God out? Click the share button at the bottom, share it to your wall. I'm going to pray. I'll pray while you do that. Heavenly Father, I pray that people hear your word. I pray that people are taught your word verse by verse. Lord, that this generation, that may be the very last of generations, God, would know the word of God and not merely believe the words of man and the, the images of you that are painted from the pulpit every Sunday, but that we would go to the word of God, explore it, know it, and therefore know you. I pray this, Lord, in the name of Jesus, in accordance to your will and your desire for your children. Amen. So, whew. John 16. So I, I'm studying for Ecclesiastes, and I'll just mention right now, um, as I was listening to a sermon, uh, uh, the verse that we covered yesterday got mentioned, and I just thought that was kind of cool. Uh, when Jesus says uh, in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And so in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's that famous song by the birds, right? And it talks about a time to speak and a time to stay silent. And it's just a good reminder once more uh, of that tactfulness. That there are times and seasons for everything we do. And it takes discernment and it takes the Holy Spirit to teach us, lead us, and guide us so we don't open our mouths at the wrong time. You know, there's a time and a place for things. And there's just not one approach or one way to get the gospel message out. There's only one gospel. There's only one way of salvation. But we can walk people to that door and reveal the door, Jesus Christ, to them in a bunch of different ways. Let's just say this. There's only one road to the Father, and that is through the door, which is Jesus Christ. But there are many roads to Jesus. Some of us go down the broken road, God bless the broken road that led us straight to him, right? And other of us, we're on the straight and narrow since we were little kids. So anyway, seasons and times, that's from yesterday. We want new stuff. So John 16, 16, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. So he's discussing his departure and his return. Why does Jesus always say these turn, these, I'm coming back, you'll see me in not that long? Well, many of these men were martyred. In fact, all but John were martyred, and John might have wished he was martyred. He was boiled in oil, and he still lived for a few decades after that, at least a couple decades after that. This old man was in his 90s, past 100 possibly. He was at Ephesus by the time he died, after being out on the island of Patmos as a prisoner in a, in a mining camp where he wrote the book of Revelation, John was then brought back to Ephesus. And the stories go, and they sound just like his first epistle. He would continue to say, you know, little children love one another. They would carry him in on a cot, lay him down. And you have to think, he's the last apostle at this point. He's the last of Jesus' disciples. In fact, he was probably the last of almost anyone who had actually seen Jesus. He lived so long. He lived like 60 to 80 years, 60, 70 years past the resurrection and, and ascension of Jesus. And so he, would, he may have been one of the last people alive who saw Jesus. So everyone wanted to hear what he had to say. What did he say? They would carry him in. And with what little breath this old man had, he would just simply say, little children love one another. That was his message. Why? Well, <laughs> he wrote the book of Revelation. Jesus appeared to him on Patmos, and he made him write seven letters to seven churches. John was the pastor of one of those churches. He was the pastor, the bishop, that whatever you want to call him, of the church at Ephesus. 
and they have good works at Ephesus, but they had lost their first love. So what does John spend the rest of his life doing? Telling them the message. Little children love one another. I don't think it'd be uh, far-fetched to say if Jesus returns in the near future, I bet you he'd like to find us doing one thing, the thing that lets people know that we are his disciples, that we love one another. Verse 17 says, Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us? A little while you'll not see me, and again a little while you will see me, and because I go to the Father. And they said, therefore, What is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he's saying. I think still today we wonder, what is a little wild? Um, you know, in the book of Revelation, when it says, Behold, I am coming quickly, that word quickly is taka something. <laughs> I don't have it memorized perfectly, but I know it's tack, and it's where we get our English word tachometer. Now, as a as an automotive teacher, I know what a tachometer is. I'm sure a bunch of you do. But for those who don't, forget it. It's that RPM gauge, right? When you rev your engine. A lot of cars don't even have them these days. But, you know, it revs and you see the little tachometer move. It doesn't tell you um, how long your engine's been running or how long until your engine stops. It speaks of the speed in which your engine is spinning. Jesus, when he says, I'm returning quickly... That word in Revelation, it doesn't speak of the timing. It speaks of the matter of his returning. When he returns, it's going to happen fast. And there's going to be no time to prepare, no time for last-minute confessions, no time for last-minute professions of faith. When he's back, he's back. When he calls his church up to be with him in the air, it's done. There is no time to get anything Put into order. When the bridegroom comes, we better have our little lamps full of oil and the wicks trimmed. And so your day today, your day tomorrow, you know, there's not time to put things off. You got people who you're trying to slowly win to Jesus. If you haven't watched the news lately, realistically, we should be getting things done. Do you have a brother? who really hasn't given his life to the Lord. Now, I know it'd be awkward. It'd be very awkward to talk uh, with your family members that if they don't get right, they're going to get left. How much more awkward when they get left and all of their saved brothers went to heaven and left them behind? So, they're asking, what do you mean, quickly? Well, Jesus, in verse 19, knew they desired to ask him. And he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you'll not see me, and again a little while you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will again see you and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. You see, before his coming, it will be a sorrowful time for believers. Times are kind of tough right now. To be honest, they can get much tougher. Um, but I don't know. I think people sometimes act like what we're going through right now is so horrific. It ain't good, but it's not nearly as bad as how it can get and how it will get. And there will be sorrow like a woman giving labor, but eventually that sorrow will come to an end, at which point the sorrow won't even be remembered because of the joy. I've stood by my wife through all four of our children and I can tell you all about the sorrow and I can tell you that the moment a baby is laid into her arms, pressed up against her chest, it's almost like the pain isn't even there. Oh, it's there, but it's like she doesn't care. It like doesn't bother her anymore. The bother's gone because the baby's arrived and all the pain and sorrow will get left behind because we're going to be with the Lord. And it's like nothing else will even matter. Wondering what heaven will be like. 
The main key is this, because the Bible only gives us so much. Many new believers, young believers, unbelievers, often want to know a lot about what heaven's going to be like. And we do have descriptions, but you see like Paul mentions how it's like, I, I wasn't supposed to talk about it. I, I was told to be quiet about it. John even had things in the Revelation. He says, don't talk about that. You can't talk about. And so there's going to be some mystery as to what we're going to see. But what we do know is it will be joy unspeakable. It will be something that will be so wonderful, the pain, the sorrow, it'll be gone. My first, would have been my first, first pastor's conference, I went down uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, got to see a whole bunch of pastors at the time. I didn't even know half of them, and now they're some of my favorite pastors to listen to. Um, it was a wonderful time. But I think for me, one of the biggest things was being around all these Calvary Chapel pastors on my right, on my left, in my front, behind me, and sing and worship. And the worship was just so sweet. And I think it was sweet because as one would hope, pastors are, not all, but you would hope that pastors are spiritual people. And this room was filled of men and women, husbands and wives, who were just praising God and worshiping. And it was just so wonderful. And I thought to myself for a second, I had a kid back home and a wife I loved, but I wouldn't have missed it if I could have just stayed there and worshiped forever. And for me, it was a beautiful picture. That's like, that's what it's gonna be one day. I can remain and just worship forever. And some people say, oh, worshiping God for eternity would be boring. Eh, well, it's because you haven't experienced it. In that moment, I thought, you know what? I could be here forever. And one day I will. And it's going to be glorious. And all the pain and all the craziness of this world, it's going to be gone. So hang in there. And remember there's urgency. The disciples, the apostles, they lived life as if Jesus could return at any moment. I believe we ought to do the same. You see, the book of Acts isn't supposed to be a high and lofty description of what these mighty men of God did. It's the description of what the church does when it's obedient to the word of God, when it believes in the promises of God, and it goes forth to complete the commission of God's church to make disciples, that we are sharing the gospel and we're edifying one another. So, Jesus is coming. Live like it. Jesus doesn't want to find you high on pills. Jesus doesn't want to find you screaming at your spouse. Jesus doesn't want to find you doing all these things. I mean, that's the thing is I don't want to be found that way. And so, hey, time is short. Time to get right. Time to make some hard decisions and live life with no regrets, full of the Spirit, racking up points and heavenly rewards with a life that's worth living. God bless you guys. Where did we make it down to? We made it down to 22. It's pretty good. Chapter 23 tomorrow, guys. Or chapter 16, verse 23 tomorrow. Take care. Bye.